Welcome to the Night Tube. I'm Stephen Knight. I hope you're all well. Another fantastic guest for you this week. I'll be speaking to co founder of Atheists for Liberty, Thomas Sheedy. I've been looking forward to speaking to Thomas for a while now about Atheists for Liberty, and it just so happens we managed to make the conversation work to coincide with some rather absurd American drama surrounding a lot of the prominent atheist groups and Richard Dawkins. No doubt many of you would have seen this, read the news articles. I've uh, posted a blog on it myself, which I shall put in the show notes. But long story short, it seems like a lot of the big American atheist, secular and humanist organizations have been infected with this new woke intersectional way of viewing the world which is not good, and uh, we shall get into that on the podcast. Thomas is somebody who's taken a very keen interest in American atheism for a while now. He's got some interesting insider experience, which he will share with us on the show. He'll be telling us exactly when it started going wrong and what we can do to push back and support an organization that has no time for woke religions and wants to get back to a more principled, individual-focused way of advocating for atheism, which is exactly what I'm looking for. So I should put a link to Atheist for Liberty in the show notes. If you like what you're hearing from Thomas and you want to put your money where your mouth is and be part of a pushback to the direction previously reliable groups are going, you can become a member, uh, which I myself have done. So head on over to the website, take a look. This is the kind of thing you feel you can get behind. Please consider becoming a member or following the various social media accounts, signing up to the newsletter, etc. You can keep up to date on the podcast at gspellchecker.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit subscribe, give it a like, share it around a bit, leave a comment. If you're listening to the audio version, leave a review. Um, enjoy. Welcome to the Night Tube. I'm Stephen Knight, and I'm very pleased to welcome Thomas Sheedy, founder of Atheist for Liberty. Thomas, how the hell are you? I'm doing great, Stephen. How about you? I'm wonderful. Um, it's been a very eventful few days. We've been trying to arrange a conversation for quite a while, actually, and it's just sort of been fortuitous that it's landed on today, and we've got a lot to talk about in terms of ideology uh, infecting various American atheist, secular, and humanist groups. Uh, before we get well into that, maybe you can just tell my uh, viewers, listeners, uh, a little bit about yourself. How would you describe what keeps you busy? So uh, I'll, I'll state this. I'm the founding president of an organization called Atheists for Liberty. We stand for free speech, free thinking, and freedom for all. We care about five core principles individual liberty, supporting a free exchange of ideas, supporting and defending the United States Constitution, we're an American-based organization, upholding religious liberty and defending secular government. Those are our five ideals. And we intend to continue a mission that was sort of set forth nearly 20 years ago, the, the sort of um, eruption of atheist activism and the push for a secular and rational civilization. Um, a, a effort that sadly was discontinued by many of the various different organizations um, that exist today, that still continue to exist today in the world. So when did when did uh, you found uh, Atheist for Liberty? When was its inception? So uh, myself and our board chairman, we came up with the idea for Atheist for Liberty in 2019. We saw the complete collapse of the atheist movement in the United States. We saw the failure of Reason Rally 2. We saw various different organizations losing millions upon millions of dollars. We saw no one having an interest in atheism anymore. We saw everybody, at least in the cultural limelight that isn't woke, that isn't very indoctrinated in extreme politics, move away from talking about atheism to talking about um, social issues, politics, freedom of speech, combating wokeness, matters like that. That's why the intellectual dark web became so popular. It was sort of a a, a, a walk away moment from new atheism into something else. And we felt that the conversation that relates to atheism and secularism is still so important. It's a conversation that really shouldn't have ended, especially since on a civilizational level within nearly every single modern country, religion is dying. 
religious belief and religious um, attendance is dying and we are evolving into more secular society. Um, so we, the conversations around um, atheism real, really still needed to be had, despite the fact that there have been sort of cultural changes in the intellectual sphere of things. And so we felt it was so important um, to uh, create Atheist for Liberty as a result of that. So we, we started the idea in 2019. We were kind of building that up, getting incorporated, getting all the hard work done. And then we publicly came into inception in 2020 by premiering at CPAC. So you mentioned the Reason Rally there. So maybe you could just explain what that event is, how big it was when it started compared to the follow-up. What, what exactly went wrong there? So in on March 24th, 2012, there was a massive event called the Reason Rally. It was a gathering. This was at the peak of the atheist movement in one of its most healthy stages in life. You had 30,000 atheists gathered in the rain in Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States, celebrating reason, celebrating rationality, celebrating the idea that it's okay to be an atheist, that we should fight together for a separation between church and state. We had 30,000 atheists, people with various different views, politically, culturally, socially, gathered together to share um, to, to share sort of a cause to be involved in the fight. And we, I got to say, the movement did a phenomenal job then. A few years later, um, the movement as a whole really died out. And by June of 2016, we saw that come to fruition where in reality there were between maybe 500 to 3,000 attendees in attendance um, due to the woke infiltration and ultimate destruction of the atheist community. So when did this start creeping in? Is this because of a change of personnel in the hierarchy of these organizations? Are they just following cultural trends? What, what can we pinpoint both. both? So this started in 2011 around right. 10 years ago, nearly 10 years ago at this point, there was an, there was an Atheist Ireland conference in uh, 2011 where there was, where one of the speakers or one of the popular attendees at this conference was a woman named Rebecca Watson. Rebecca Watson, like at every Atheist conference, usually if you're a popular speaker and you engage in, in great discussions with attendees, you usually stay in the hotel lobby or the hotel bar till around three or four in the morning. And that's exactly what Rebecca Watson did, likely talking about science stuff and and, and various yeah. things around i can uh, around relate those I, i've been there yeah you've been there you've been to conferences you know exactly how this goes so rebecca stayed up at the hotel bar till around what three or four in the morning and there was a gentleman that was having a great conversation with her she got tired and she decided to uh to go to her hotel room and this gentleman just happened to follow her into the elevator um and while they were both in the elevator the elevator together he politely asked uh, if she would follow him back to his room for a cup of coffee. Now, we obviously know what that means. We obviously know um, what uh, getting a cup of coffee in a hotel room after a great conversation with someone you like uh, means. It's, it's a ask for sex. It's a consensual ask for sex. She declined um, that coffee and she went to her room. He stayed in the elevator and went to his room, Right. You would think that would be the end of a normal, understandable conversation where yeah. she just rejected his offer in a consensual, polite, respectful, civilized way. No. Apparently, his ask for coffee in 2011 was an example of systemic sexism within the atheist movement. That the atheist movement, one of the most accepting movements in the Western world, was filled with racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia. Various different claims and accusations made by people who sound like they, they got a full-fledged course of gender studies in college. <laughs> in 2011, this was very odd for, for most people, most liberals even in the atheist movement back then, people who considered themselves even to be quite left. Um, it, it, it was seen, people like Rebecca Watson were seen as tiny little infiltrators that were coming into the atheist movement and claiming that there was sexism everywhere. The majority of the movement ignored these people for a very long time. Well, what happened? People like Rebecca Watson, Jen McCrite, PZ Myers, a few other uh, various different activists, they started to get their people into various different organizations in the UK, in the US, around the world, into board positions, into volunteer positions. And soon enough, after I would say five to six years of hard activism on their part, the atheist movement caved um, to, to their demands. We saw a healthy, amazing movement that could have changed the world 
turn into a joke, a joke. We wasted lots and lots of money because we believed that these infiltrators were actually talking about sexism and racism, like how we thought things were in the 1960s to 1980s. There were good liberals that fell for the bait of what these infiltrators infiltrators wanted and ultimately led to the destruction of the atheist movement. Yeah. So this Rebecca Watson incident became widely known as Elevator Gate, didn't it? And um, Richard Dawkins got into a lot of hot water for commenting on that. He sort of wrote a little poem called Dear Muslima. Dear Muslima. Yeah, and the, yeah. the thrust of it was him, you know, mocking the idea of this privileged woman claiming victimhood, uh, sort of Western feminist claiming victimhood, while turning a blind eye to the genuine horror and misogyny visited upon women in Islamic cultures. And I Absolutely. spoke to just what someone today who, who has skeptic in their bio, who was adamant that Richard Dawkins was saying Western women should shut up about sexual assault and worse because... Other people have it bad somewhere else. So th- this, like you say, it feels like an infiltration. It feels like the start of uh, you know changing trends. Why was why were author- organizations which are usually so well placed to resist sort of irrational ideology? Why did they just fold completely to this infiltration? That's a pretty good question, right, Stephen? Some of these organizations have million dollar budgets and have existed for decades. These are organizations that you think would have never fell to an ideology like this. Um, I, I think the problem was is that people like Rebecca Watts and people like Jen McCrae and PC Myers painted themselves as liberals, as people who wanted to fight against bigotry. And if you are David Silverman, an American atheist from those years ago, at least, if you were Dan Barker and E. Lori Gaylor at the Freedom from Religion Foundation, Roy Speckard at the American Humanist Association, Gail Miller of Recovering from Religion, I like him, by the way. I'm just stating her as an example, and all these other, uh, uh, Noel George of the Foundation of the Unbelief. When you are the heads of these organizations and you have people coming to you saying that there is sexism within your group, that there is racism within your group, that there is homophobia within your group, transphobia, Islamophobia, you take that matter very seriously as a professional. And a lot of these people, maybe it's a generational difference, just didn't understand where the origins of this sort of college campusy gender studies, 500 genders, racism everywhere kind of belief system originated from. They didn't realize that the claims that these infiltrators were making were different than the sort of accepting liberalism and civil rights that they were kind of used to. When you think of combating racism, Stephen, uh, you know, a normal person would think of combating the Ku Klux Klan burning a cross on your lawn in the United States or combating uh, the idea of neo-Nazis parading down streets in London yeah. or something like that, right? And plenty of atheist organizers fell for that bait, so much so that just in a short time span of five years, the hype, which was once new atheism, which caused gotten thousands upon thousands of people to fill up stadiums to see people like Professor Dawkins, the late Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, ex-Muslims of all types, various people that, that wanted to have a genuine conversation. If human civilization was ready to move beyond religion, something very, very serious in our short 10,000 year span of life on this planet, it died in five years because we decided to accept campus, uh, campus gender studies ideology over a movement that could have changed the world. And it's horrifying for me. So do you think this dipping of the toe, or rather full adoption of, of woke ideology, has definitely had the ne- negative effect on these organizations in the sense of membership, support, etc.? Is it not yes. possible that maybe they've just appealed themselves to a new group of people who are now supporting them it's but it, it's both for, for for that question too i so i turned eight i was 18 years old when the second reason rally happened i just started to get out of high school i was about to graduate i was about to begin my career i was building up a linkedin page i was starting to to build up my resume to eventually join one of these organizations and become an employee or maybe even one day an executive director or president and i <clears throat> i saw the failure of Reason Rally 2 before my very eyes. I was, I was very excited to be at Reason Rally 2 to finally have an opportunity to meet these heroes of society, these heroes sort of, a, of secularism and atheism and free thought. And I saw such a low attendance. So in 2017, uh, 2016, 2017, 2018, I was going to all these various different atheist conferences and I was asking all the executive directors, all the presidents, what did we do wrong? What 
happened? What caused the atheist movement to fall so quickly? So quickly, right in the beginning of my career, where I where I I needed to you know make a living, I needed to get started in my professional life. I wanted to sort of see an end goal to to what would happen to me once I graduated college. And a lot of them were very silent. A lot of them were very, very silent about the true cause of all of this. Only one executive within an organization in the Secular Coalition for America tapped me on the shoulder and whispered to me, this was at a conference in 2017. He said, Thomas, do you really want to know? Do you really want to know what caused Reason Rally 2 to fail and the movement to fail and all that? Social justice. Mm. He walked out. Here. That's the real reason. And for so many years, uh, I would say from 2013 to like 2017, some, some people even today, oh, uh, actually, I'll, I'll explain this better. When the new atheist movement was popular, there were three groups of people. When this infiltration was going on from 2011 to around 2016, and even now, there are three groups. There were the social justice warrior types, the atheism plus folks, the people who said that there, there's atheism and sex, I mean, there's sexism and racism and homophobia in the movement. There were the anti-woke people, people like Thunderfoot, people like our public relations manager, Justin Bakula, some of the early voices against this infiltration, but they were kind of alone. They were kind of seen as the the, the slime pit type mm, people, the people that we should not dare associate with. They're talking about things that we can't talk about in the open. And then there was this third group. They were, These were people in the middle. These were people who maybe were secretly on the anti-SJW side or people that were on the woke side, but they kind of remained in this sort of camp of professionalism for many years. I think you and I have seen these types of people, people who really had a re- had a real view of atheism plus had a real view on elevator gate but they couldn't actually admit it because they were in an organization or they were a youtuber or they were someone influential and and if they spoke the truth about what happened to the atheist movement they they sort of feared that their their careers would kind of end there there are some people actually still in organizations today who i know of personally who have spoken to me personally who are in this third camp who were trying to just stay quiet as long as possible to still have a career and to not come out and to not speak truthfully of what happened to the atheist movement. For a long time, I was in that camp too. When I graduated high school, for two years, I ran a local atheist nonprofit organization. And on the most part, the only non-woke views that people actually knew I held were views on Islam. That that was sort of seen as the most anti-woke that you could get. Okay, speaking Critiquing the Islamic religion, like critiquing Christianity, uh, a few of my friends might unfriend Thomas, but <laughs> at least he could stay in the movement because Islam is a religion. Okay, we have to tolerate that. We have to tolerate people like Faisal, who who mock Islam. We we, ha- we can't cancel him. He is, he's got brown skin. We can't get rid of Faisal Saeed al-Muttar. We can't do that. So there were so many people that were in this sort of third neutral camp of professionalism. Um, I, w- I would say my friend, uh, former American atheist president, David Silverman, was kind of in that camp, although he was a little more in the social justice, hmm. on the social justice side at the time. Um, there were plenty of people who were in this middle ground where they couldn't speak up. And now, uh, you've probably noticed this too, after the second reason rally, once MythCon 4 started to be attacked in 2017, once more and more people were being canceled in late 2017, early 2018, the rationality rules incident in 2019 relating to the transgender pronouns and the, the canceling in the atheist community of Austin, and what happened as of a few days ago, Richard Dawkins' 1996 Humanist of the Year Award getting canceled, you're now starting to have some of the people that were sort of in the neutral professional camp that lean toward the social justice side completely abandon all of us yeah completely attack all of us people like Hemant Mehta in 2014 and 2015 none of us knew Hemant's actual views towards these social justice things he was very professional he was very quiet obviously he was a liberal left-leaning okay that's the you know I don't have a problem with that um but some of us even thought that he was against some of the social justice stuff because back in 2014 and 15 we didn't know where the wind was going to blow we didn't know if the social justice elevator gay people were going to win or if people like Thunderfoot and Justin Bakula would be successful at pushing this stuff out of the movement. So do you think there's a, a, down, a... I'm sorry, what? So do you think there's an aspect of opportunism involved in this in terms of just Absolutely. sincere adherence to the ideology? Exactly. Yes. There are some people who saw what side won. And they either started to speak out with the intellectual dark web and 
people like Peter Bogosian, Michael Shermer, Melissa Chen, Yasma Muhammad, I am Husi Ali, people like myself, people like the Atheist for Liberty team. And there are some people who chose the other side. There are some people who chose the other side because, well, they still talk about atheism 1.0 issues a lot. They still consider themselves to be progressives or liberals or whatever. And they're going to stay in that camp. We've seen it. Look at Seth Andrews. Look at Hemet Mehta. These are people who many of us, even anti-woke folks, right, thought of to be respectful, neutral um, people who talked about religion, who talked about secularism. But now I've seen a lot of anti-woke people come to me. Thomas, why is Seth Andrews saying all this stuff out of all this? Because he 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 found out what side won, and that side clung to him very deeply and talked to him quite a lot about these issues and convinced them to be on their side. He saw what side won. I think he has some. He might have some anti-woke views, but I don't think he's going to be expressing them for the sake of his career. He's on the American Atheist Board of Directors. He can't dare say anything that uh, that could jeopardize his career there. And now look at Dawkins. Well, yeah, let's let's talk about Dawkins. And uh, I mean, I remember this being a big issue for me a, a little while back when we had that horrible anti-Muslim massacre at Christchurch in New Zealand. And right. I mean, this was really absolutely nothing to do with, do with movement atheists or critics of Islam whatsoever. Yes. But it seemed to me that American atheists really panicked and in in a sort of desire to distance themselves from this horrible act. They threw yes. Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris under the bus and shared Omar. news articles uh, implying that they were somehow culpable in this terrorist act because they were critics of Islam. Now, my feeling on this is if you're an American atheist organization and you can't defend prominent atheists being smeared and linked to acts of terror, what, what use are you as an organization at exactly. all. So how, how do we explain that where they, they are two thought leaders, uh, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, they've probably done more for movement atheism than anyone on the board of American atheists Correct. now. How do we get to a point where those individuals are just thrown under the bus in the most abhorrent way imaginable? Because the infiltrators are now in control. They don't, they think Sam Harris and they think Richard Dawkins is, is part of a, uh, you know, uh, horrible, evil, toxic, um, system, a system that needs to be abolished. Um, you, you're seeing right now, look at look at the lineup at so many of these conventions now, so many of these online conventions. Find a single new atheist, find someone who, who is at least acceptable in our eyes from 20 years ago, from 15 years ago, from six to seven years ago on the speaker's roster. You won't find many. You'll probably find none. That's, that's a situation there. They wanted this to happen. David Silverman is gone. Richard Dawkins, his his um, Humanist of the Year award has been taken away. Sam Harris, no atheist organization will contact Sam Harris now. They wanted this. They got it. And in 2019, because they were so successful at the Second Reason Rally in 2016 with, with sort of their side winning the elevator gate conversation and taking over the movement, they felt that it was, po it was now politically safe for them to publish that Huffington Post article. They wanted to do it, Stephen. They wanted to do it for years, these infiltrators, and now they have the leverage to do it. Now it's safe for the American Humanist Association's board of directors, American Atheist staff and American Atheist board uh, members to publicly go after Richard Dawkins, who's part, of the, who's part of CFI, which is in the Secular Coalition for America. Even in 2016, when they won, they were still trying to be careful of what they can say. Richard Dawkins still has quite a lot of influence in organized atheism. They couldn't do this in 2016. In 2019, it was safe. And now in 2020, they took out all of their cards. Now they can fully dump Richard Dawkins without any amount of political um, consequence for them. Well, it might be worth mentioning the specific landmine Richard Dawkins stepped on. Now, Richard Dawkins is a scientist. He's it's big on thought experiments. He likes to, he, he's always dipped his toe into areas that are contentious, especially when they intersect or trespass on the field of science. He's, he's gone after creationist. Uh, he's an even evolutionary biologist after all. So obviously he's going to take an interest in the current gender debate. And I, I can't think of a more mild way of sort of dipping your toe into this arena than the way he attempted it on Twitter. I think that was his first mistake, expecting any sort of reason <laughs> from Twitter. But he, he yeah. sort of 
asked to discuss the question about what's the difference between somebody who identifies as black and gets absolutely vilified uh, from the public versus somebody who identifies as a woman, as a man and doesn't kind of question. And he, he kind of finished his tweet with discuss. I'm paraphrasing there. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. And this blew up massively and it seemed like there was a coordinated effort between all the american secularist atheist humanist groups to come out with the most i say some of those they was all trying to outdo each other with the most uh, you know strident and insane statement on the matter i mean you mentioned american atheists withdrew their humanist of the year award 1996 from richard dawkins which i'm sure he'll be devastated about um uh, american atheists spoke about his sort of rhetoric lending itself to anti-trans violence, uh, American humanist. Uh, I think they took it somewhere more exceptional. Um, so what what is it about this one particular issue, which is gender identity, not even trans rights, mind you, just the debate around gender identity that has become absolutely forbidden in, in this skeptical discourse within these organisations. It's one of them things you must agree to one specific viewpoint on, otherwise you get put in the uh, the bigot basket. I'll state this, uh, even though I don't have to pander anymore to, to intersectional organisations and intersectional activists, I will say this, in no way do I ever want to discriminate against transgender individuals. I support the idea of transgender people, whether you agree scientifically with the idea of transgenderism or, or, or gender ideology or gender fluidity. I do not want transgender people to be ostracized or bullied in any way. When I was in high school, I was vice president of the Gay Straight Alliance as a straight person standing up for transgender rights. Right. So I, I want to state that off the bat. Um, it, the, the problem, though, is that in the sort of hierarchy of intersectionality, transgender people are, are sort of near the top at the moment in 2021 in that sort of hierarchy. And because of that, um, it's taken very seriously by the woke crowd. Um, I think also the fact that you're seeing now in 2021, um, Richard Dawkins being ostracized, Richard Dawkins now being removed. Richard Dawkins is sort of the last person, one of the last people that are still, that are still seen as semi-acceptable in the atheist movement, in sort of what the atheist movement has become. But Richard also has a link to people like you, people like me, people like Melissa Chen, Peter Bogosian, the sort of IDW type people who kind of left the atheist movement or got kicked out of the atheist movement for not being woke, not being insane. Uh, and um, I think they wanted to get rid of that last link. I think the woke activists want to get rid of that. Like Richard is the last link between the two culture wars. And, you know, you have Richard talking about Christianity and critiquing Christianity and critiquing religion. Yet you also have Richard Dawkins retweeting people, uh, people like Helen Pluckrose, uh, talking about James Lindsay, talking about, you know, plenty of Quillette type, IDW type, new discourses type figures. And that's a no-no now. That's a no-no. Why, if I was in charge, if I was woke and I was in charge of the atheist movement now, why would I want someone like a Richard Dawkins in my camp now. I have all the power now. I have all the control. I won in 2016 in Reason Rally 2. Why do we have to keep Richard alone now? That's the thinking that they have. That's why the coordination has happened so successfully. They they own everything now. They don't need Richard. They, Despite the fact that Richard has advanced atheism and the acceptance of atheism more than anybody else in the world. He's he's basically a hero, I would argue, to the West, a hero to Enlightenment values, someone who, by the way, is a very sensitive individual. I'm not even saying that as an insult. He's someone who doesn't really like to go out into the limelight and go on the attack much. Richard's career, when it came to uh, Richard Dawkins' career, you know, in relevance to criticizing religion, has uh, he's like a groundhog that's kind of come out of the hole, being forced to speak about a matter because he thinks it's that important. He's a very sensitive, very polite British individual. He doesn't like to do this kind of stuff that much, but he did it anyways. And he advanced the normalization of atheism and scientific literacy more than anybody else, I would argue, in the world. If I was in charge, but, but the woke people that, are, that now control the atheist movement or what remains of it, because it's basically dead, <laughs> they want to get rid of him. And now they can without any consequences whatsoever. Yeah, he's a very old school skeptic in the sense that he doesn't consider how something's going to make him look when he says he's he's purely interested in what the truth of the matter is and he, he's happy to poke and prod. And Sam Harris is, uh, I would put, in that category as well. So I don't think he quite yeah. 
understands sometimes why he can't say the quiet things out loud. And it's it's just strange yeah. that free inquiry and um, taboos are being upheld by ostensibly secular atheist humanist organizations. So what can Atheists for Liberty offer people? Because I'm a little bit concerned at the moment about not only atheist groups and organizations becoming more unpopular, but the idea of religion becoming more appealing as an alternative to this woke ideology. Now, I'm seeing a lot more people now that you wouldn't usually expect calling from for a resurgence of Christian values, Christian society. Correct. So, I mean, how can we sort of deal with that uh, emergence? Stephen, I shared literally the exact same concern. We're seeing people who probably you and I still respect, right? I'm not going to state their names out of professionalism, sort of trying to become sort of cultural Christians, yeah. talking about Judeo-Christian values, talking about how bad secular liberalism is, stuff that wouldn't have even been seen as acceptable in our circles in like 2018, 2019, right? Um, we started to, we've also started to see, I, I'm someone who operates in the conservative movement, for instance, we've started to see in the conservative movement now a resurgence of young Generation Z, a small group of young Gen Z theocrats wow. who are going after the conservative movement for becoming too secular, too accepting. Um, and I know who these people are and these people know who I am. And this is a problem when we also don't acknowledge how important the discussion about atheism and secularism still needs to happen, how good secularism is, the reality that uh, of atheism still rising, the UK, the US, Canada, more and more nations becoming non-religious. And if we don't provide secular solutions and, and talk about this in a secular way, yeah, you're going to start seeing people cling to this sort of cultural Christianity, Judeo-Christian values, an idea that's not going to be popular. If our society is becoming more secular, if atheism is rising, you really think that, that Christianity is going to surge up again? I don't think it is. But the problem is, is that if all these thinkers provide Christianity as a solution, It'll only embolden the woke left. It'll only embolden our enemies. And it'll only distract us from the reality that we live in a secular age now. And we have to deal with reality in that instance. It, that's why it's so important that Atheists for Liberty exists. I am totally against social justice warrior culture. I am against wokeism. I was on the front lines and saw what happened to the atheist movement, the first movement in all of corporate um, movement-based Western culture. We were kind of the first community to be impacted by wokeness. We, we even predated Gamergate. I, I know exactly uh, the problem that wokeness is, and we're fighting against that. So it's sort of what half of Atheist for Liberty's mission is to do. We see wokeness as a religion, and we want to fight it because it is dogmatic in its nature. Simultaneously, we're also atheists. We don't believe in God. We're not religious people. We can respect religious people, and I we respect religious freedom. We want to fight for religious freedom. But simultaneously, let's not call ourselves something that we're not. We're not Christians. And if we call ourselves Christians, that's actually disrespectful to Christians. Christians believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that died for their sins. You, as a intellectual, scientific person— don't enlightened, scientific, sort of minded, non-theistic individual. Don't believe in that. So be respectful to your Christian friends and not call yourself that. And this is why another reason why it's so important for us to not go down that path is that, you know, it, it took us such a long time for atheists to become accepted in society. You know, there really was a stigma in the 2000s against the idea of being an atheist. I faced it myself when I was in middle school and high school. Um, so it's it's it, it's really disappointing to see that there are some atheists, very anti-woke, intellectual, awesome atheists sort of ditch the idea, the, the, the atheism that they spoke about just a few years ago. We need to talk about both. We need to mold these conversations together. Um, Dr. Peter Boghossian, he's he's on our advisory board at Atheists for Liberty. He talked about how we're now in something called Culture War 2.0. Culture War 1.0 was kind of the new atheism stuff. And Culture War 2.0 is us fighting against social justice warrior culture and wokeism and all that stuff. We got to combine the two of them. We have to provide secular solutions uh, to this kind of stuff. Um, yes, we need stories. Yes, we are animals. Yes, we are limited in, in things that we can do. Yes, we many of us fear death. Yes, many of us want a purpose in life. I want a purpose in life too, but simultaneously, we also have to be real about the fact that we don't really know if a God exists. So 
let's acknowledge that religion for thousands of years was was kind of humanity trying to solve that problem of where the sun went and, and what happens when we die. That was, in my opinion, sort of a noble endeavor because they believed that their religion was true, but now we know better. And just because we don't have all the solutions right now doesn't mean that we have to force ourselves to purposely go back into dogma for the sake of what? Having the sense of purpose? I think we can all try to find a sense of purpose together. And if we don't have all the answers now, we can fight to figure out those answers later on. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. And I'm, I'm just wondering as well, if organizations weren't so obsessed with trans issues and how many genders there are and how, you know whether or not we should announce our pronouns, what sort of issues that fall into the atheist secular sphere should atheist activists really be paying attention to at this moment in time in America? Oh, plenty of issues. So first off, like I said, I operate in one of the movements I operate in. I operate in sort of the, the anti-woke liberal sphere. I operate in libertarian movements, the liberty movement, but I also operate in the conservative movement. I have been paying attention to this slow rise of Gen Z monarchists and theocrats who basically want to sort of bring back the memory and the vibe of the religious right of the 1980s. They're a small group, but they're gaining a lot of power. That is, those these people are real Christian nationalists who we should actually be paying attention to. Another issue that we could be discussing is the topic of Islam. Islam, Islamic immigration is rising throughout the nations of Europe. We're seeing in Britain, we're seeing in Germany, we're seeing in Sweden, um, no-go zones continuing to rise and become more popular now than ever, regardless of what your stance might be on immigration is, we have a big civilizational battle in that regard. You have people who don't even respect the idea of women being able to go outside and operate you know, as individuals, people who don't respect the idea of individual autonomy, wanting to come in and wanting to corrode and just ultimately destroy those nations and bring up bring about religious nations based on their own belief systems that's something big that we could be talking about even in the united states context there's there's and there's a lot more too a lot of the same old battles that we can continue on i've always liked the freedom from religion foundation and their sort of fight of keeping church and state separate moving 10 commandments monuments onto private religious property where the government should not infringe on their rights to have their statues while the government can remain neutral that's still a very important fight the fight for ex-Muslims to be accepted. Ex-Muslims, people who left the religion of Islam wanting to wanting to be safe and free. Um, issues regarding, uh, uh, you know, fighting back against creationism. There's so many things that we could still be discussing. Even if something doesn't seem as trendy and as cute, even if something seems so 2010, so 2012 to talk about, oh, that's the previous culture war. There's still plenty of things that we can work on together. This is why it's so important for the atheist discussion to still continue. We can still talk about social justice. I see it as a religion. We need to fight back against that too. But we can't stop talking about this in a secular fashion because if we do, it's just going to be two different guns. One being the religion of social justice, the other being an old ancient religion that could rise and take away our rights. Why would you want to be shot with either gun? Why would you want either bullet in your body, even if one bullet happens to be bigger? I see a lot of people saying that, oh, old the old religions and the theologies of old, even if one day we become a um, authoritarian state where one, one dominant religion reigns supreme, it's much better than wokeness. I don't want either option. Yeah, I think those people have rather I short memories. Choose. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is troubling how much this has infected not just atheist movements, I'm talking about institutions, academia, the media, journalism, every aspect of our life now seems to have some aspect of, of woke finger wagging and ideology attached to it. And I mean, how can Atheists for Liberty sort of maintain um, opposition to that whilst also maintaining a sort of neutral political stance on the face of it. I mean, is that would you right. say it has a particular political leaning? Is the board a mixture of p political leans or is it more conservative? Yes. So so th this is this is a problem that we are facing right now. I do not want Atheists for Liberty to only look like a conservative organization. Here's the issue. Atheists for Liberty publicly premiered in February of 2020, just a few weeks before the COVID pandemic became huge and swept the entire world. 
So we were we did publicly premiere at CPAC, the conservative political action conference. But I want to make myself very clear. We're not only reaching out to conservatives, we are reaching out to anti-woke liberals, centrists, and libertarians too, people who would not even want to associate themselves with, with something like CPAC. But we are reaching out to conservatives too, because there, there is a huge amount of atheists that are even at conservative events, like the Turning Point USA Student Action Summit, CPAC, and way more. We're going to be going to conservative events throughout the year. The problem was, is when the COVID outbreak happened, all the anti-woke sort of liberal, um, uh, what's it called, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, I forget the exact uh, the exact specific, IDW type events. They got canceled. All the libertarian events got canceled by either the state or by the boards of these conferences and things like that. So we were really left with with a very tiny amount of options. And the only conferences at the time politically that wanted to remain open and fight to stay open were the conservative ones. So. Obviously, we, we wouldn't want to miss an opportunity to go. We went. Um, when it comes to the board, we have people from a variety of views. I myself operate in the conservative movement. I politically, personally identify as a Republican, but I also used to identify as a liberal just a few years ago. I'm not a walk away. I was sort of on the left back then because I was a single issue voter. My, right. The single issue vote for me was separation between church and state. I was heavily invested in the previous culture war, and I am not a fan of theocracy. I'm not a fan of Christian theocracy. I'm not a fan of Islamic theocracy. I voted for secularism. That's why I was there. When I started to discover a wide array of other issues that didn't really relate to secularism at all, I realized, oh, I happen to be more on the right. So just want to make that clear. I know there's a whole uh, sport of calling people that they don't like grifters. I'm not a grifter. This is where I stand politically. Um, but we have uh, Michael Trollin, who, you know, you know, Michael, he's our board chairman. He's sort of the co unofficial co-founder of Atheist for Liberty. He identifies as sort of a liberal independent. You have Eric Hartman, who's on our board as well. He, he's, he's sort of in the Republican sphere as well. Um, you have our advisory board that's filled with people from, from libertarians to anti-woke liberals. We have a wide variety of people with various different opinions that are in our organization. And we want to sort of continue what the new atheists started, building sort of an enlightened coalition of people that might have different views on certain social issues left and right, but people that at the end of the day want to see secularism prevail, want to see reason prevail, and ultimately want to see atheism accepted. And that's what we're trying to build at Atheist for Liberty, a coalition of reasonable people, liberal and conservative alike. That sounds reasonable. I mean, there is an aspect of preaching to the choir with a lot of these groups and not really engaging with, you know, quote, unquote, the other side. And it was interesting to see you at CPAC because conservatives are not generally considered atheist friendly. I think there's a lot of misconceptions on the conservative side about, you know, the conflation between atheism and communism. So, I, right. I mean, what sort <laughs> of reaction did you get there? You set up this stall, you're advocating for atheists for liberty, you're open for discussions. What sort of discussions did you have there with the members? Did you learn anything, you know, interesting? So something I do like about this sort of new culture war that we're in is that it has changed the conservative movement, too. It has made the conservative movement kind of have the vibe of, oh, we are the real sort of accepting people. We're not like the social justice warriors. We're not going to call you racist, sexist, homophobic. And we are reasonable. We don't believe in 500 genders. Because of the wokeness that has emerged throughout our entire civilization, it has actually made the conservative movement more secular and scientific as a result of that. It has sort of actually made, I would make the person, this is my personal view, I view the conservative movement of today as sort of liberalism of the 90s and 2000s. Right. That's basically where, where it's kind of gone now. Are there, uh, you know, conservatives who hold views that, that definitely, uh, that I might disagree with when it comes to religion? Absolutely, that still does exist, but it is in such a, a small capacity now that really we, we were just welcomed in many ways with open arms. Um, and it is also very generational too. Because of the rise of atheism, a lot of even conservatives that are millennials and Gen Z are identifying as atheists, or at least identifying as Christians, but open to the idea of atheists coming to their event or secular or whatever. That is kind of the vibe that we're sort of getting. Um, Facts don't care about your feelings automatically has a secular tone of it. If you if you listen to Ben Shapiro, if you listen to any of the Daily Wire crowd, if you, even if you listen to Charlie Kirk, who's an evangelical Christian, what do they call wokeness? A religion. Yeah. They call yeah. wokeness a religion. That's the success of the atheist movement right there. That's the success of sort of people who came from the atheist movement going into sort of the IDW liberty conservative sphere of things – 
changing things up a little bit. My only problem is that they don't admit that it's secular. They don't admit that. And if they did, they would get a lot more people on their side. They'd be winning a lot more elections. And ultimately, we'd be able to build more of an anti-woke coalition for reason, despite people's political affiliations. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to explain to people when we go to things like CPAC. We actually have a lot more in common than others might want to suggest. Are there ultra-religious boomers who really don't like us being there. We did get, you know, do, do they exist? Yes, they do. We did get one or two, I'll pray for yous. That did happen. And, and, and there are some people, yes, who don't like the idea of atheists being present. But overall, I, I'll say this too. A lot of these, the people that really don't like atheists for liberty, really don't want atheists for liberty to be at CPAC, these are people not even being allowed at CPAC, not even allowed in the door, because pe these people are actually seen as too extreme for CPAC now. The sort of theocrats and monarchists who I sort of told you about earlier in this discussion, those people are not allowed in the CPAC doors. They're not allowed at SAS. They're not allowed at all because the conservative movement has been changing. Yeah. Uh, am I yeah. saying, by the way, to any conservatives watching this, am I saying that you have to abandon conservative principles? No. But the idea that you have to believe in a supernatural being to stay stand for gun rights, to be against illegal immigration, to be against critical race theory, um, you know, it, let, let's say even you are right wing on the issue of the 2020 presidential election and voting regularly. Do you need to believe in a God to have a position left or right on that issue? No. It is irrespective. It is irrelevant when it comes to uh, uh, when it, when it comes to these matters. These matters are material matters, materials that we know of in 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 the real mortal world, and and that is the simple claim that we are making at, at these events, and we've gotten fairly accepted as a result of them. Do we have more work to do? Yes, we do, but that's that's sort of the reaction that we've gotten, and and we're very glad to see it. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for crossing the political divide and, and talking to people who disagree with you. Otherwise, you just sort of smell in your own farts, to put it nicely. But, um, I mean, I do think the election of Trump did play a massive hand in a lot of this woke ideology rising up. I saw a lot of previously sensible people lose their head on the topic. And I, I've always advocated for not treating Trump voters like they're the devil. It never made sense to me. And these people have right. their reasons. They're not just one thing. But also it's the awkward thing around this conversation is that the rise of just Trumpism, the sort of really toxic, cultist, hardcore uh, fans of Donald Trump were a legitimate problem, probably caused a lot of trouble for a lot of people. We saw it culminate in the the senseless violence at the Capitol riots. And is there any recovery from that viewpoint now that a lot of secular liberals have that that what culminated on Capitol Hill is what represents Republicans, is what represents the right, is what represents conservatives? So I hope so. And, and and this is this is actually another problem that I see, a potential problem that could arise in the future, sort of a split between sort of the anti-woke left and the anti-woke right. And I think it is just unnecessary. My views on this whole matter uh, relate to this. Are there people that voted for President Trump who still who hold views that I would consider to be insane, asinine, conspiratorial? Yeah. Yeah, I would. There are there. We have to admit there are people on the right who just are off their rockers when it comes to some of the things they say. We have to admit that. Simultaneously, as someone who was kind of on that side, I will state this. And by the way, everybody, this is my personal opinion, nothing to do with Atheists for Liberty. And this is with deep love and respect because we need anti-woke liberals in this fight too, please. I'm going to state this point. This is my partisan political opinion. My issue is that I think wokeness would have continued regardless of who won the 2016 presidential election. Maybe Trump amplified it a little bit, but look what happened when Joe Biden assumed the presidency. On day one, he reinstituted critical race theory. Day one of his presidency. Critical race theory will now be taught, or at least the option of critical race theory will be able to be taught within the federal government. This is stuff that is spreading throughout universities. This is stuff that is spreading throughout K through 12. It is everywhere and it's about to get 10 times worse. Leading up to the election, I saw disagreements between prominent anti-woke liberals that you and I know and prominent anti-woke conservatives that we know. And the sort of liberal argument that I saw was, well, Trump is just Oh, I mean, Trump is off his rocker because Trump is off his rocker. You know, he's not this sort of solution for enlightened anti-woke 
sort of uh, principles that you guys claim to fight for, then who is? Right. If, if President Biden is instituting critical race theory on day one, he's completely pandering to the third, fourth wave feminist types. What solution do we have? And and that's and you might be an anti woke liberal and might disagree with Trump assuming office, but in my opinion, I think anti woke liberals and anti woke conservatives should just not even fight about it because there really isn't a perfect solution to it at all. Joe Biden is instituting wokeness. He is doing it. You might not like Trump. Trump's out of office. It's done. Let's work together now on on issues and on other goals that we can work together on. That's really all it should be about, because you really don't get a a perfect solution if you're an anti-woke liberal at the end of the day. Yeah, I tend to think of the woke uh, as having a more of an anarchist mindset in the sense that it doesn't really matter how hard Joe Biden panders. Um, He's not offering anything they want. I think is the under point here. The, the demands are not reasonable. They're not tangible. And we saw that with the, the rhetoric, rhetoric of BLM as soon as he was in office. And we saw that people in the streets yeah. causing trouble and violence. So, it's, it, I mean, would it be fair to say that politically America's the, the most fractured it's been in a long time? It feels like it's yeah. just one bad incident away from <laughs> violence in the streets almost every Absolutely. day. Absolutely. So I'm I'm a uh, I'm a public administration major and a political science minor. I've spoken to plenty of people that that are that consider themselves to be highly intelligent in the arena of studying politics, and there are people who are not conspiratorial who have literally said that we are very 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 close to a civil war happening yeah. in the United States, and it's definitely possible. I will say that, and I'm, I I hope no one here thinks that I'm conspiratorial as well. I even think that this could potentially happen. I heard people it's saying, scary. I heard people suggesting this years ago, and I, I did file that in the, the sort of conspiratorial, conspiratorial crazy. hyperbole. And right. ju- yeah, just seeing how quick things can change and escalate, I'm not so sure anymore. And I'm very cynical uh, of the idea of everything turning out fine, unfortunately. Right. I, 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 I do worry for it. But the you know what? Coming from the atheist perspective, you only live once. And with me, I could have in the atheist movement, for instance, I could have um, I could have spent a few more years being silent about my real views on critical race theory, my real views on radical feminism, my real views on all this stuff that killed the atheist movement. I want to see the atheist movement in a healthy state, but there was nothing anymore that I could do. Excuse me. Nothing more that I could do to help fix it from my sort of local in organizational level, I've been I've been involved with nearly every single one of the major organizations in some position, one or another. There was nothing I could do. There was nothing that people like you could do anymore. It, it just it just was beyond salvageable. And then they ended up kicking a lot of us out at the end of the day. We only live once. And would you want to spend the rest of your life being quiet? not being able to express what you really think, not being able to fight for what was right, not being able to to just feel good when you went to bed at night. You might, you know, it, 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 there, there might not be an afterlife. You might not be, you might not benefit a lot from it. There could be consequences to it. But per- personally for me, I would rather die fighting for what I believe in than die cowering away and feeling like I wasted these 100 years that we get. Yeah, I, I agree. If I could sort of engender any idea to people, it's that, that you should push back against this whilst you have the opportunity. And I think you'll be surprised that like, you'll probably receive more support than you might think. I, I know the mobs come for people online, but I've been slightly encouraged to see the response online to the official statements from American atheists, American humanists. And it's funny, it does sort of feel in a way like this woke ideology is the one thing that's actually going to unite religious people and atheists in response to that pushback. Has. Yeah. It definitely has. Um, if you look at uh, Peter Bogosian and James Lindsay, for instance, they've been having a lot of conversations with a great organization, a religious organization called Sovereign Nations. Yeah, but I, I, I was there at the, uh, the London conference that they had. Yeah, you, yeah. you probably saw how great it was. You know, I, I know Michael O'Fallon. Michael O'Fallon loves me. We're both executives of our respected organizations. He's a great guy. I love chatting with him. But he's an evangelist. He's a, he's a Baptist. He's a Baptist Christian. Um, and we definitely have quite a few disagreements. But uh, here, by the way, here's something that I really like about him. He gets it. He's not like he's not some overly religious person who is like, oh, how dare the atheists come into our events and our conventions and and try to unite with us. Atheism leads to Marxism. 
something I've noticed about O'Fallon, he, he doesn't play that game. He understands the necessity of people with different worldviews when it comes to the supernatural, things we can't, we don't really know if they exist or not, honestly, coming together to solve an issue that we know exists in the real material world. He gets it. And that, and you're absolutely right. I, I, I do hope that, that there is more of a unification between sane, normal people, theist and atheist alike, coming together to fight to save our very civilization. How can we even have a conversation if God, uh, on, on God's existence or not, where the very freedoms, like freedom of speech, freedom of association, just believing in, in normal things that we thought to be just true in the most basic sense are being corroded? We can't. We can't have that. We have to go back. Like I feel like we're if wokeness fully prevails in civilization, we're going to be going back like 300, 400 years in terms of human progress. And that's really, really bad. That's really bad. So I'm glad that there is a bit of a unification between uh, religious people and atheists in this regard. And what I like about O'Fallon, he's not stopping us from talking about atheism. He's no. not stopping us from being atheists. We don't. We don't. We don't have to play the Judeo-Christian game in front of him too. I say this quite a lot. When, when, you know, I was in the atheist movement, sort of in that third neutral group, I kind of had to play the social justice game, kind of shutting up while they spread elevator gate, gender studies, intersectional nonsense that killed the movement. There are some people like like that you're frustrated with sort of that are in the conservative movement spreading, playing the Judeo-Christian game. These are atheists who are not Christians. They might like Christians, but they, they, they're sort of pretending to be Christians playing that game. Let's not play either game. Let's respect religious people, even if we disagree with their religion. And we can be truthful about our views, just like they can be truthful about their views about atheism. There's nothing stopping that from happening. And I'm hoping that that that, that understanding can just grow and grow and grow as we get more numbers in this fight. Hopefully. I mean, it's, it's very nice to see a movement pushing back and recognizing wokeness uh, as a religion. I do think there's a, a lot of utility in the idea of addressing it as uh, an infringement of your religious freedom. I think that's a very interesting approach uh, to look at. This is certainly in the workplace when people are trying to push, you know, critical race theory on you and diversity training, things like that. So Thomas, I was in church. Look at look at CR. If I, yeah, if I saw critical race theory and gender studies invading my church, I'd be concerned. I'm not granted. I'm not a fan of theology. I bet the, more and more people will stop believing in theology. My, I think that's a good thing. But simultaneously, I don't want critical race theory and I don't want social justice warrior culture to go after my good friend, Michael LaFell. I don't think that's right either. And um, I, uh, I, hope, I hope that reason prevails at the end of the day and we'll die trying. Yeah, I remember I've been, I spoke to Michael at the event and he was very welcoming, very open. I, I explained to him what my interests were, what my focus was, how I was very anti-religious, but we sort of agreed on the core principles of, you know, free expression, you know, religious freedom, the right to say what you think. And as long as yeah. you can find them things, everything else just feels like detail to me. And I, I've mm -hmm. tended to find now, which was which is worrying, that the, the more far leftist atheist skeptical circles are more unwelcoming to dissent and, and people with my opinions than say an evangelical Christian who I probably agree with almost nothing on in terms of ideology. So it's just a, a weird juxtaposition to find yourself in at the moment. People that will shake your hand and act like basic, like, you know, when both of us were children, we were probably taught basic manners. Don't scream at people you disagree with. Don't throw your food at people. Yeah. Standard stuff like that. Evangelical Christians will act in a mature way and shake your hand and say, good evening, sir, how are you? Right? Just like how six, seven, eight years ago, respected, enlightened atheists and organizers of atheist circles would have done the same thing. We are at that low of the bar now. What are the evangelicals doing? Oh, well, they said hi to me and shook my hand and didn't call me a racist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I'll take it because at least we kind of agree on the basic rules of how our society should at least function in terms of basic manners, how to operate as an individual with individual autonomy. It's kind of sad that we're at that level now, but we're at that level. And um, yeah, you bet your butt I'm going to work with those, those people, at least on the issues that we agree on, while also being honest about what, who we really are. Yeah. We can do both. Yeah. We're humans. We're not, we're not, we're, we're animals, but we're not like other animals. We can multitask. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I, I'm in total agreement with you on that.
Well, it's great to see you in, in that space. Now, I think it's really needed, especially in the States. It, it, the uh, the UK organisations haven't quite been infected yet, but I'm pretty sure it's in the post. I'm watching them very closely, <laughs> I have to say. So I, I'm glad you're out there doing what you're doing. I'll, I'll point more people towards Atheist for Liberty so they can they can see what you're about. Uh, where can people find you? What kind of things can people do to support you and, and find out more? Sure. Membership for Atheists for Liberty folks is $10 a year, $5 for students. You could donate more if you're if you're able to. It really helps us a lot. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Your your donation, at least the US sense, is tax deductible. It is a tax deductible donation. If you join and become a member, you get access to our private Facebook group and Discord server. We do trivia nights. We do game nights. We do plenty of uh, speaker series. We're actually going to be bringing on guest speakers from our advisory board and from politics and culture and more to actually, uh, we're going to start sort of a podcast series eventually in the future that actually involves member participation. And you can potentially be a part of that if you become a member at Atheists for Liberty. We're out going to conferences trying to normalize atheism in circles that really just haven't haven't really seen many atheists before, at least in an organizational sense. We're doing what we can to stay on mission. We fight for common principles that regardless if you're liberal or conservative, if you care about common enlightened values, you will agree with us. You'll come on board with us. And I really hope that you all do. So you can find us at atheistforliberty.org. Please come and join us today. Additionally, uh, if you liked me, you liked my appearance here on the show, I have a YouTube channel. Just search up Thomas Sheedy. I'm coming out with more content that also relates to the culture war, relates to this these, these civilizational issues. Um, and, and I'm trying to release a video once a week. And my next video is going to actually be about academia, wokeness infiltrating academia from a more financial sense, uh, from a more financial perspective. But you can check all that out. I'll provide Stephen with with some of the links and information about us. And I want to say, Stephen, thank you so much for having me on. I, I want to close by stating this. Um, I have plenty of conversations with my board chairman, Michael Trollin. We always try to figure out who we want to associate with, who we want to talk to. We've always been big fans of you always. The work that you have engaged in and standing up for reason is something that has always turned us on. And I want to just express my gratitude in all the work that you've been doing, speaking out against these this cowardly, this cowardly infiltration and this insane amount of wokeness that has just curtailed everything reasonable, regardless of what nation you're in. So so from the bottom of my heart and speaking on behalf of atheists, I want to say thank you, Stephen. And I, I really want to come on in the future and have more discussions with you. This was awesome. Oh, Thomas, that was really kind. Thank you very much. And obviously, you're welcome to come back and talk to me anytime. You obviously know your stuff. And it's like I say, it's really great to see some sort of organized pushback. I suppose one qu final question. Do you accept international members as well? Some of my European yes, and UK. Yes, we do. We members. have quite a few British members actually. I'm going to be I'm going to be linking my uh, my friend from Glasgow this interview once it uh, once it releases. So uh, no, people can join internationally. We do have Stripe and we do have PayPal. I believe they do uh, they do have currency exchanges where you could still become a member with with the currency of your nation. Um, we'd love to have you. We'd love to have your perspective because this wokeness is not just infiltrating U.S. based atheist organizations. It's infiltrating the U.K. ones too. It's infiltrating everything. Uh, Elevator Gate happened in Ireland. Didn't even happen in the United States yet. It, it just infected the United States the most. Um, so uh, we're happy. We'd be happy to have anybody on board, and we're looking forward to working with all of you and moving forward in the future. Wonderful, Thomas. Thank you for coming on and, and telling me all about Atheists for Liberties. This has been this has flown by. Yeah, definitely has. That that's what happens when you when you uh, when you fight for something you believe in and enjoy it in the process. An hour just goes by like that. So thank you so much for having me. Anytime. Thank you very much.